Okay, so thank you for your presentation. And uh, it was very interesting because it was a kind of moral epistemology. <laughs> you used the words of morality to speak yeah. about cognition, rational cognition, and so on. So, questions, observations? Lorenzo, uh, I have a, a vague, general, and not very articulate question yet, but you will kind of recognize it because it's kind of parallel to one that I, I, uh, I asked of you about coherence before. And I won't present this as an objection because I think we'd probably end up disagreeing. I, I, agreeing, I mean, as you convinced me before, I mean, you're a pluralist, and, uh, and uh, I think that's uh, the right way uh, to go. Uh, your, your argument here is, uh, uh, is subtle uh, and clever. Um, my, my general worry is, to, uh, and I'd be interested to see how you respond to this, by focusing so much on rationality and, in a way, analytic epistemology, it seems to me to throw a kind of conservative cast over this entire subject. Um, the way I feared before that coherence did, but I, you convinced me that you we're using coherence in a, uh, uh, in a uh, uh, quite liberal way. So, uh, I mean, the, the Leibnizian criterion, uh, you know, in some form you can trace it back to Descartes on mathematics, uh, you know, that if two people disagree, they're, one of them made a mistake, at least one of them made a mistake, right? Uh, 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 philosophers then, uh, you know, approach rationality first in terms of deductive reasoning, and in terms of uh, modern mathematics of probability, um, uh, and there's lots of reasons that uh, Professor Carla uh, Cellucci here and uh, Emiliano and uh, uh, others, uh, Donald Gillies uh, has commented on this as well, uh, think there, are, there are, are defects in both approaches. Um, so I just wonder, I mean, I'm not against talking about rationality, but it seems to me uh, we have no general theory of rationality in terms of a decision theory, which applies to all of this. and. Um, uh, that it, it, I'm not sure it's going to help us very much at the uh, at the frontiers of research, where people are trying to propose new ideas that may, uh, in many cases, go in clear violation of some uh, some uh, seemingly well-established uh, constraint. I mean, we, I don't want to. In, in fact, in my talk tomorrow, I will try to avoid extreme cases, but just to throw one out now. I mean, Bohr, 1913. Uh, explicitly rejects Maxwell's electromagnetic theory, at least in certain applications, uh, for uh, electronic orbits and so forth. Um, well, I guess my my my, my question then is uh, is you and Christian uh, Dunya surely disagree uh, with with this this view that that it's you think it's very fruitful to talk in terms of rationality and rational disagreement this way. I mean, why? Why not say it's just kind of pragmatic? Um, uh, look at the history of religious controversy, uh, you know, the, the, the Thirty Years' War and all of that, and surely, surely one of the uh, motives uh, of the uh, people preaching tolerance uh, during the uh, Illuminismo, the, uh, the so-called Enlightenment period, uh, to Voltaire and so forth, uh, where, where look, we have to be fallibilistic about religion. Uh, in that, in that, uh, there's no way that either side, uh, any of these sides, can prove prove their uh, prove their case. Uh, therefore, just as a pragmatic, you know, uh, uh, sort of a pragmatic reason, um, let's uh, be reasonably tolerant, uh, just to avoid uh, strife. Uh, and then, in the case of science, we have another pragmatic reason of uh, waiting a little bit and uh, and seeing whether one of these approaches will bear fruit. And if it does bear uh, striking fruit, as uh, Bohr's uh, theory of the atom did. Then it's going to attract some adherence. Uh, some people will continue to disagree with it because they're convinced uh, Maxwellians in every respect, and um, and that's fine. Um, so I'm not sure I'm being very coherent here, but um, I don't know. I, I I mean I'm a guilty party too. I mean I used to talk about rationality all the time myself, and, uh, and now I just wonder if, uh, as a, you know a minor contributor to these uh, discussions. And so I just I just worry that that there's a kind of philosophical bias here. Uh, you know, the philosopher's view of things, rationality, 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 and that it, okay. it's not going to help us very much at the frontier. So let's shut up and let you talk. <laughs> I, 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 I see your point, but um, let me try to answer it. Maybe I'm not going in the right direction, but um, I think what you're heading at is the distinction between what, what is sometimes called epistemic and instrumental rationality. So 
absolutely pragmatic view, which you mentioned, we'd rather concern whether something satisfies our goals and then we specify these goals, what they are. Some of them will be cognitive goals, some will be more other goals, which are with some usefulness or utility, but they don't have to be necessarily epistemic goals. Or we can just speak of epistemic rationality as instrumental rationality, where we consider epistemic rationality as whatever satisfies the cognitive goals which we have specified. And um, does this, if I answer that, does, will this relate to what you... I think, well, I think so. Okay. Fire, fire okay. away. Okay. Because, You've answered me before and I've been uh, okay. reasonably okay. well convinced. So, yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I have a, a strong disagreement with this equation of epistemic instrumental rationality. Uh, the reason is that, um, uh, let me give an example. It, it, for instance, a scientist, pluralist sometimes argue, let scientists pursue any inquiry which may be complete nonsense because if it have enough resources, if it have not enough money, that's just good for science. Because you never know if this will turn out to be right. You never know if this inquiry will turn out to be right. So it's instrumentally rational, given the cognitive goals of science, that we work on this inquiry. But that doesn't mean it's epistemically rational. What does this mean? It doesn't mean that we have good arguments for that. So when we speak of rationality here, we primarily, we, we make this epistemic and non-epistemic values. Uh, even though epistemic values may be prospective epistemic values, as you have argued, so we don't, uh, epistemic is not uh, taken to be a flat epistemic justification as traditionally considered. Epistemic uh -huh. just re concerns uh, epistemic values in general and cognitive goals. We can speak of cognitive values, but this can be prospective values just as well. But the uh, type of rationality, which the reason why we speak all the time of rationality is that we don't want to confuse the utility which comes with certain other interests, such as financial interests, ethical interests, etc. So the, the, the question which we are primarily interested in, do we have good arguments, epistemic arguments, or cognitive reasons to consider this uh, position viable, fruitful, uh, epistemically fruitful, no matter what may be usefulness of it, or what may be other things. Well, maybe I'll pick up another thread of what you said. A kind of meta methodological point. I, I agree there may be other perspectives on similar problems which are all very interesting and maybe even conflicting with our perspective which emphasizes rationality. Still, I think rationality is a, is a nice way to look at it. Now you can say, okay, we don't have a good theory of rationality. I also agree with that, and it all the time changes, and it maybe changes diachronically, change, it is also synchronically different what we perceive to be rationality. And it's always right, there's always indeterminacy, but this goes all through this talk. There's always indeterminacy, there are always tensions. So I don't, I don't consider that to be a problem, but I, I think we try to incorporate it in our approach, this kind of wagness of rationality, this kind of struggle which we have with that very notion of. Thanks very much. Uh, I have a question about the, uh, the level of your analysis. And I'm not absolutely sure that I understood it as well, but probably my question will get that out. Um, so I wonder whether you want to say that A and B rationally disagree uh, only if they sort of hold on to these uh, norms that you've laid out at the end, right? Because it seems to me that we can say from an analysis, an analyst's point of view, as opposed to an analyst's point of view, that A and B may uh, rationally disagree Why they don't no, definitely. follow those things. Right? Because yeah. you can imagine lots of disputes in science where, where scientists do not listen to each other anymore, do not keep up the tension anymore. But we, as, for instance, philosophers of science, wish to maintain the view that there is actual rational disagreement at some level. Then you apply some reticulation in order to something or something else in order to, to, to rationalize the debate between them. Um, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure about the, the relation between the analysts and the actors point of view in your analysis. Is. So I think we agree that what we call rational disagreement is really before the point where we consider do actually the scientists act according to our tolerance notion. It is really the question, do we have a disagreement where we have good reasons to consider both sides to be 
such that their conclusions or the arguments they give are the result of a rational deliberation. And then we can, of course, think about that, how is it recognized from an external point of view or from an internal point of view. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about is kind of second level rationality, which we would say, okay, there are even more rational if they would act according to our tolerance norm. But, but that's not what we, what we take as part of our definition of rational disagreement. Rational disagreement can be without the agents acting according to our norms. Yeah. Otherwise, you would be kind of circular. That's true. Yeah. I, I, uh, I wonder, around the, um, well, I'm very sympathetic, if I understood well, uh, the, uh, the sort of uh, effort against uh, the extreme relativism, I mean, sort of uh, any perspective works because you have some lenses. Anything and, uh, yeah, you know, so uh, that would be very pertinent uh, social. The social science is probably even more than uh, I mean, uh, natural science. Uh, however, uh, more in the content, I mean, and, uh, it seems that your rule of tolerance seems, seems a little bit too tolerant to me, and uh, it's not clear what the limit. You talk about there are limits of tolerance, and uh, I, I, they, I don't grasp them so clearly. What are the limits? If I take a little to the, your your rules of tolerance, and uh, and it seems to me vis-a-vis uh, -vis that the notion of rational disagreement is too narrow. There are many sorts of rational disagreement. I mean, unless we are we are sort of naive realist, uh, you know, if there is disagreement, one should be wrong and the other right, but I don't think that anyone here would subscribe this view. Uh, if we admit that there are a number of methodological decisions in science, if you have the acceptability of observation and statement, like the, the guest of the view, and all the other methodological decisions, tools, even in Galileo and the church example, well, at the time, uh, you know, it was not clear what the evidence was because you really don't have the theory of telescope. So, all these sources, uh, of, I mean, the same sources are sources of rational disagreement. Is that correct? Because you, you can't have, uh, and the, at a certain time, sort of undecidable, or not really clearly decided uh, question. So, it, you know, so at this point, I wonder. Uh, that's why it seems to tolerant. So the limits and the normative side does not come out clearly. And I found the notion of commitment uh, contradictory with the rational disagreement argument. I mean, if you have commitment, why should you have commitment? I mean, commitment, it's an, it's an irrational attitude. Why should you be committed? Well, that's a problem. That's a problem. So it seems to be contract. It's a more that is at the very start. It's it start with the, an irrational act. So if you are committed, you don't you don't have rational disagreement. You have irrational disagreement, or it's not clear what the basis of the disagreement is. So I, I'm not. Okay, but uh, I would like to start from the last point which you brought up. Um, for instance, there is this perspective which uh, sometimes pluralists argue for, well, we just have to be pluralists and we don't have to be committed to our stance. We, we can just regard our theories as, as models which could be turn out tomorrow to be wrong, but we don't have to argue strongly for them. Oh, that's what you mean. So that would be not having committed. Now, the point is that we take the commitments of science at face value. We, we, we just take the fact that scientists argue for their stance, even yeah, if they are anti-realists. Okay. They don't have to be realists to be committed. They just think this is, uh, they are very good arguments for, okay. for this position. So that, that's what we mean by commitment. Okay. okay, now the question, the other question. <laughs> It's that the rules are a little bit too tolerant. So what, yes. when, when are you not willing to uh, take ser seriously? Yes, yeah, so we have the synthesis. Okay. Okay. An observation. So I wanted to add, so maybe this is following your answer, that 
there is, on, there is also philosophy that is responsible of this wonderful way of reasoning of the, because Socrates said that we have to respect doubt. When you respect, when you respect doubt, doubt, it is because we use a psychoanalytic lexicon. You are not narcissistically in yourself, but you respect something external. So you can tolerate other positions. You can tolerate, for instance, the empirical response of the nature. So in this life, he think that it is also philosophy that is at the beginning of this aristocratic way of thinking. As regards to the problem of the community, imagine Socrates or Descartes and uh, the myths, the magic, the religion of the ancient Greeks. The attitude of Socrates was considered irrational by the others. And Socrates considered irrational the attitude of the others. This is the interplay. Yes. The, in, in, you explained that in, in this uh, uh, way of seeing the heuristic reason, the moral heuristics that you have to tolerate, it is considered horrible in the light of other human, human beings' mentality. For instance, in the light of theology, for instance. Because it, it is completely different. You do not have to tolerate the position. But you're speaking about epistemic uh, tolerance. So, better somebody, I mean, it's, it's important for scientific framework. We, we give a, it's a normative guideline for science. Yeah. That, that's what the, 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 the idea is. But, uh, yes, so, so the, the, just the, the, the borders of toleration, which you, which you mentioned, uh, this regards. Uh, um, it's a tricky question because there, there are these indices which we built up and then, for instance, different philosophers would argue that there are different points when you don't want to tolerate the other side anymore. So, for instance, if the other side stops participating uh, in the discussion, they, for instance, uh, stop giving any arguments which are uh, empirically informed uh, or which, I mean, they're thinking of uh, empirical science. Behavioral. A behavioral norm. <laughs> Sorry? A behavioral. No, no, no. It's a, it's a, it's a, well, it's a question of a discourse, so scientific discourse. So you, you pose a challenge and the other, the other side, that is typical of what, for instance, House of Chang argues that this is something where we don't want the other side. We, we don't consider the many was more serious participating in scientific discourse. So this is, this is, a, this is a type of indice where you don't see why should you if they don't reply to your challenge, why should you be tolerant towards them? So there has to be some kind of ongoing debate back and forth. Uh, or you want to do some of this? Of course, we didn't talk about the demarcation problems. Yeah, that's so, it. And of course, there's a whole literature on that. That would all fall within our uh, disavowal criteria. So demarcation criteria. What is true okay. so it's not but it's a hotly debated topic we can so solve. Different philosophers who would argue that there is a strict demarcation criteria, they would put this strict demarcation criteria into our they would plug it into our this our criteria. Other philosophers who are more flexible about the the demarcation criteria would keep it intentionally flexible because of arguing this is exactly what may be at stake. And we intentionally wanted to keep that open because of the difference. It's difficult to be the we have another question. <laughs> the last. I, I remember a uh, good example in neurology uh, regards uh, of uh, uh, the Oberon model of, uh, by Jakob Samolov, a famous uh, biologist. And they, um, about this model, Oberon model, um, formulated two different uh, theories, starting from the same results. So I think that in this case, uh, this disagreement is about uh, beliefs and about uh, maybe prejudice, you know, we can say. So, uh, in your opinion, would you uh, call this disagreement rational or irrational? And how would you suggest to solve uh, this kind of disagreement in science? Well, uh, there are cases, are you? I don't know the specific I also don't know. But I want to 
Okay, I, well, I don't know the case itself, but uh, I think it's, uh, I, I just don't understand how I would approach this, this question if I would look at that case. Because one of the, uh, I, I often see in the literature when, when philosophers bring examples of rational disagreement or they call it deep standing disagreement, they often bring examples of very simple underdetermination. So they give for instance, there was recently a case in archaeology, there were found some fossils in New Zealand, which some archaeologists uh, interpret as a, 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 a underdeveloped homo sapiens, but, but other, other archaeologists interpret as a completely different type of, um, it's not homo sapiens, I don't know, it was something else, it was hobbits. Yeah, they call it some kind of hobbit. And they have different explanatory frameworks for this. The problem is that the tissue which was found in some of these fossils which were found, they were, at, uh, in the, they were totally destroyed, so they cannot reconstruct DNA out of it. So they can, cannot come, come up to an ultimate conclusion. But then these two hypotheses are simply underdetermined, and they just cannot decide for either of them. So now we could say, well, they disagree on this issue. Is this really, do they really have to disagree? I mean, if they cannot determine which of the two, if it's clearly underdetermined both hypotheses, they just don't have enough evidence, so why would they at all disagree about it? Now, maybe if we go to this case and ask them that, now well, maybe each of the side would, have, would say, well, this is, they, they are very, they are, it's much clearer in view of our framework why it would be hobbits, or the other guys would say it's much, much, there are much stronger reasons why it would be this, in which case it would be a rational disagreement. But, uh, so this would you say, whether they believe in this or not, I don't care whether they believe. I, I care whether they have good arguments for, for their stance or not. And sometimes you may just find out that their arguments are not sufficiently good to claim that this is uh, uh, this that their theory should be accepted. It might be just a hunch, just a hypothesis, and the other guys could also have a hypothesis, but there is no need to disagree. On, uh, although all this what I'm saying is external perspective. So again, if we ask scientists involved themselves, they might say, well, you're just a philosopher, you don't understand what you're talking about. Internally, it's for instance, like Hassel Chang said, well, I was even Priestley, you guys are actually conventional. But what would happen if Hassel Chang went there and said, uh, was standing there beside I was even Priestley and said, hey guys, you're in conventional. I was even Priestley said, oh God, you just don't understand what you're talking about. That's the problem with this external internal recognition. So we philosophers often have a kind of tendency to be skeptical about cases to say, oh, well, that's a case of underdetermination. We should just uh, refrain from judgment, right? We should just keep these camps uh, working on their thing and then at some point we maybe can decide. But scientists are often much more engaged and they see other peculiarities which we can maybe not so easily see and that gives them a certain commitment towards the distance which we can not so easily see. Mm -hmm. So it's often very difficult to judge such cases. Mm -hmm. Last question. <laughs> <three. laughs> on this issue of engagement, um, uh, Anna Grandori mentioned uh, behavioral uh, economics uh, and I mean, one, one issue there is the old neo, uh, uh, Austrian neoclassical model require all kinds of computations that people can't actually do. It seems to me, um, on a somewhat lesser scale, the kind of engagement that you seem to require for genuine uh, rational disagreement is not realistic. I mean, think, suppose you're a, a classical thermodynamicist in, um, say, 1860, 1870, uh, the new uh, kinetic theory, the new statistical physics is being developed by people like Clausius and Boltzmann. Uh, but for the first few decades, they were introducing a whole bunch of sophisticated mathematics uh, to get very slender results, very few results, and results that were already known, basically. So if you're a, a classical physicist and, and you're in your 40s or 50s, why should you engage in the sense of trying to uh, be you know, ecstatic and put yourself in their shoes or, or anything, trying to learn their, uh, their, uh, their technique, their tricks, and so forth. Well, it's just too much work. Nobody has that much time. Yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that we actually mentioned in the paper, of course, there are the real life constraints on scientists. They just don't have the time to, to, to get so engaged in, in the view of the others. Yeah, but yeah. thus, it's, it's good that, you, that we also propose uh, form-based indices, which are much easier to recognize. So if, if the debate goes on for a very long time, there is an equal number, or more or less equal number of experts on each side, and it gets kind of... Uh, yeah, no, I think, I think there's something to that. But a lot of times at the frontier of research, you have new ideas coming up for, for which there is no long debate, not that you can appeal to historically. And, okay. and so, 
uh, we're all in the same boat there, just struggling mightily to try to make sense of the, what's going on there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. So we do not have to. Uh, there is the, the coffee break. Yeah. So uh, the, I'm, the, I'm the, 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 the we do not have to face only the green on the epistemic tolerance and no unification, no composition, no disagreement. Coffee break. On the left.